Thank you very much, Arun. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the warmth of your welcome. I don't think I've ever, ever in my life received so many compliments in a concentrated period of time. I have this new gadget. It's a battery-powered hubris alarm, and it's set on vibrate. It was going crazy over there during that introduction. <laughs> but thank you very much, and congratulations on the success of India Today. And by the way, thank you for India Today's leadership on the issue of the climate crisis. Uh, I, I deeply appreciate the, the vision and leadership that you and your colleagues uh, have provided. Uh, and, and also to uh, Mohini um, Buhalari, Buhalar, the Conclave Director, thank you so much. Uh, to all of the leaders of the India Today group, thank you. Uh, to my dear friend and longtime uh, colleague, Dr. Rajinda K. Pachari, uh, the leader of the IPCC, and Mrs. Saroj Pachari, thank you both. Um, what, a, what a joy it was for my wife Tipper and me to be with Dr. and Mrs. Bachari in Oslo, and what uh, an honor it is, in my opinion, for India to be home to uh, the individual who leads the global scientific effort to clarify the, the facts about climate crisis. I take uh, Dr. Pachari and his colleagues' work and put a bow on it. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> and I, I'm deeply uh, indebted and grateful uh, for the opportunity to be together again. Um, you made reference to my comment uh, some six years back when I was here that I used to be the next president. People laughed. I don't think that's funny. <laughs> Put yourselves in my position. I flew on Air Force Two for eight years. <laughs> now I have to take off my shoes to get on an airplane. <laughs> Let me just share with you one brief story uh, that happened not long after I was uh, here at this uh, conclave. I mean, this conclave, let me tell you, Six years ago, it wasn't as quite as big a deal as it is now. It was a big deal then, but it has grown, and it has become uh, uh, so much better known and so widely respected, I, and I congratulate you. But not long after I was here, um, I was with my wife, Tipper, driving from our home in Nashville, Tennessee, to... Uh, a small farm that we have about an hour to the east. And we were, we were driving ourselves. Um, I know that sounds like a little thing to most of you. Uh, but I looked in the rearview mirror, and on this occasion, it just suddenly hit me. There was no motorcade back there. You've heard of phantom limb pain? This was a rented Ford Taurus. And it was close to dinner time, so we got off the superhighway and looked for a place to eat. And we found a, a, a small restaurant called Shoney's. Now, in the United States, Shoney's is a, a, a low-cost family restaurant chain. And we walked in and sat down at the booth, and the waitress came over and made a big commotion over Tipper <clears throat> and then took our order and went to the couple in the booth next to us, and she lowered her voice so much I had to really strain to hear what she was saying. And she said, yes, that's, that's former Vice President Al Gore and his wife, Tipper. And the man said, he's come down a long way, hasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> and it was an epiphany, one of several. The very next day, though, this is a true story, I flew to Africa, to the nation of Nigeria, to give a speech on energy policy. Uh, and I began my speech by telling that story that had just happened the day before. And I told it in terms almost identical to the ones that I uh, have used here. 
Uh, Tipper and I were driving ourselves, uh, Shoney's low-cost family restaurant chain, what the man said. And the audience laughed, and I went on to give my speech, and then went back to the airport to fly back to the United States. And I fell asleep on the plane until, in the middle of the night, we landed on the Azores Islands for refueling. And I woke up, and they opened the door and let some fresh air in, and I walked out onto the uh, platform. And to my surprise, there was a man running toward the plane across the runway, waving a piece of paper and yelling, call Washington, call Washington. And I thought to myself, here we are. It's the middle of the night. We're in the middle of the Atlantic. What in the world could be wrong in Washington? And, and then I remembered it could be a lot of things. And, um, <laughs> but what it turned out to be was that one of the wire service reporters in Nigeria had already written a story about my speech there that had already been printed in newspapers all across the United States. I must have 100 copies of this story. And my staff was very concerned because the story began. Former Vice President Al Gore announced in Nigeria yesterday, quote, my wife Tipper and I have opened a low-cost family restaurant <laughs> named Shoney's, and we are running it ourselves. Before I could get back to the U.S., the late-night television comedians that we have, uh, Jay Leno, David Letterman, perhaps you've heard of them. Sometimes they're just not funny. <laughs> they had already had a field day with this. One of them had me in a big white chef's hat. My wife was yelling at me as she was scribbling, one more burger with fries. <laughs> Three days later, I got a nice, long, handwritten letter from my friend and former partner, Bill Clinton, who spoke to you by satellite two days ago. The letter said, congratulations on the new restaurant, Al. <laughs> we like to celebrate each other's successes in life. <laughs> and <laughs> now I am a recovering politician. And <clears throat> I'm reminded in coming here, it does seem like a lot of time has passed. Not long ago, I was in a restaurant in Los Angeles with one of my business partners, and this point was driven home when a woman walked in front of the table where I was sitting, just staring at me as she walked past. And I didn't think anything about it until a few moments later, from the corner of my eye, I saw her coming from the opposite direction. And she, again, she was just staring at me as she walked past. So I thought I should look up, and I said, how do you do? And she said, you know, if you dyed your hair black, you would look just like Al Gore. <laughs> and I said, thank you, ma'am. You sound like him, too, she said. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I've had um, a wonderful experience here in India the last couple of days, and I'm deeply grateful to India today for making this entire visit uh, a reality. I've been looking forward to this event this evening, and I've enjoyed uh, the interviews and conversations. It's been uh, really a wonderful uh, experience all around. And I, I was grateful also to have the chance to spend a couple of hours with your prime minister. I was very impressed uh, with the conversation we enjoyed. Uh, Dr. Pachauri and I uh, uh, addressed the, uh, the parliament yesterday. Uh, that too went uh, extremely well. Uh, and for the last uh, couple of days, I have led a training program, uh, training 100 men and women from all across India uh, in ways to effectively present uh, several hundred slides about the climate crisis as it affects India. And I was thinking of this, of course, when you gave me the topic about uh, leadership in the 21st century. And to me, there is a striking contrast between the confidence and dynamism and success and legendary uh, energy and drive of modern India, soon to be the largest nation in the world, already one of the world's preeminent leaders in 
areas as diverse as information technology and pharmaceutical steel and other uh, areas of business where your entrepreneurial spirit harnessed to the outstanding human resources improved by the commitment and budgetary investments in higher education of decades ago uh, and the leadership that you have, particularly in the business community, to produce uh, a, an incredible success story. All of that stands in some contrast to the position that India and most other countries in our world today have where the issue of the climate crisis is concerned. Defining India's opportunities, obligations, responsibilities, and challenges in terms of other countries seems at odds with the independent drive and spirit that India demonstrates in virtually every other area. I talk about this issue here with some great caution, merely because I am painfully aware that the single largest emitter of global warming pollution, the nation that simultaneously has the single greatest capacity for leadership, innovation, and the development of solutions to this crisis is my own country, which is also the country that has done the least in international fora to assist in the formation of a global agreement that's necessary and a prerequisite to solving this problem. We have done a lot in the United States, and states particularly, and city governments, uh, more than 800 of them, have taken initiatives that actually have resulted in some meaningful reductions in global warming pollution. But the United States should be providing leadership. And it is not news of any sort for me or others to note that we are not. But I mention this only to, to make certain that you are aware that I'm aware <laughs> that I speak from a position of disadvantage. And I do so knowingly because of my respect for India and because of my desire to speak candidly about what I truly believe is an unparalleled opportunity for this nation to take its rightful place in the top rank of leadership for the world of the 21st century. These are thoughts that your topic, given to me some time ago, provoked. I also believe that the opportunity that is contained in the climate crisis is far more important than the danger it presents. Some of you know what is by now a cliche that the kanji characters uh, shared by uh, the written form of Chinese and Japanese express the concept we call crisis in English with two characters that are sometimes interpreted uh, in the following way. The first can be said to represent danger, and the second can be said to represent opportunity. And I do believe that is a more sophisticated way of expressing the concept of crisis, because in every crisis, there is a tendency to focus on the danger, but in every crisis, there is also hidden, sometimes in plain view, great opportunity. But in order to seize that opportunity, one has to walk through the danger and summon the moral courage to face it down and then seek out the opportunity. What are the opportunities inherent in this climate crisis? India and the world as a whole face challenges for which the world has not yet developed adequate responses. The world as a whole is beset by the HIV AIDS pandemic, by the destruction of forest areas, the rapid depletion of ocean fisheries, an extinction crisis 
that on a statistical basis is actually on par with the five previous great extinction events that the scientists tell us date back hundreds of millions of years. The previous one being associated with a giant asteroid hitting the Earth, credited with wiping out the dinosaurs, and this time there is no asteroid, there is us. And we are colliding, in a sense, with the ecological system of the planet. I recall slow motion video images of automobiles being tested for safety, crashed into brick walls with the video slowed down to show the crumpling of the front of the car and then the passenger compartment. When I read the scientific reports from Dr. Pachari and his colleagues about the loss of valuable portions of the web of life upon which we depend, I have this image of a slow motion crumpling. This collision between humanity and the ecology of the planet represents a radical transformation in the relationship between people and the Earth, one that has come about rather suddenly. We are now all of a sudden, in the cliché term, the bull in the china shop. We seem to be capable of doing casual damage without fully realizing it or intending to do it. Our footprint, in the metaphor of the day, is larger. And this new relationship comes from a combination of three factors. First of all, our absolute numbers are, have increased dramatically and continue to increase. 10,000 generations of people lived on this earth before we reached an aggregate population of 2 billion. That, around the time my generation was born. In my lifetime, the population has gone from a little over 2 billion to 6.7 billion. And my generation will see the number reach above 9 billion. This is not a place to search for solutions to the climate crisis, because thankfully, improvements in the way we understand the importance of education and health care and the empowerment of women have already led to dramatic changes that are causing a stabilization of population. Much more is known now than even 20 years ago about why family size declines in nation after nation. They have done the analyses and proven that there are four factors, all of which must be present in some degree. The first and most important is the education of girls. The second, related to the first, is the empowerment of women. The third, I see a distinct pattern in the applause of these first two <laughs> factors. Come on, men. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> the third is the availability and culturally acceptable ways of fertility control, family planning. And the fourth, sometimes overlooked in the context of population dynamics, is an increase in child survival rates. An African leader 60 years ago, Julius K. Nyeri, said that the most powerful contraceptive in the world is the confidence on the part of parents that their children will survive. When girls are educated and women are empowered and have the means to participate effectively in the choice on family size and have the confidence along with their partners that their children will survive, they choose to have smaller families. That's true everywhere in the world. Individuals make different choices and must be allowed to do so, of course. But the pattern is now very clear. Nevertheless, even though population is stabilizing and moving from one equilibrium state to another, from high birth rates and high death rates to low birth rates, 
and low death rates, and even though every nation is at some point along that transitional curve, it is an important part of the explanation for why we suddenly find ourselves in this unfamiliar position capable of doing such destructive harm without really meaning to do so. The peer pressure of population on resources is a big part of the new reality that we have to absorb and take account of. The second factor after population is far more important, the scientific and technological revolution, which is putting into the hands of human beings technologies thousands, even millions of times more powerful than any our grandparents or great-grandparents could have imagined. We have the privilege to be joined this evening by Craig Venter, one of the greatest uh, scientists in history, a real pioneer in the, the completion of the human genome. And genetics is only one of many fields where the secrets of the universe are being unlocked by the cleverest among us, giving us tools for good or ill, and thankfully most are being used for good, but some have side effects, and I don't speak about genomics in this regard particularly, although the danger is there as well, as Craig has also said. But think of um, the powerful technologies for war. Alfred Nobel thought that dynamite would be an instrument of peace and would lead to an end to conflict. It was used for other purposes. Many of the technologies that we initially pursue to improve life turn out to have other uses as well. And some of the technologies that are now available to us for the exploitation of natural resources are being used with such abandon that the consequences have added up to a powerful destructive pattern. Let me just pick one example. Ocean fisheries. The nets that people have used for thousands of years harvest the bounty of the sea and leave the engines of its productivity intact. But it is now possible to pull nets that are 70, 80 kilometers long, dragging along the bottom, vacuuming up every living thing in vast areas of the ocean, throwing away 90% of it killed for nothing in order to make profit on the 10% that can be taken to market. This is insane. It is, over time, suicidal. And it is only one example. The destruction of the forests. The, the casual destruction of all these living species that I mentioned earlier. We must find ways to become more conscious of the impact of these technologies. And that leads to the third and final cause of this new relationship between humankind and the Earth. And that is our way of thinking, our consciousness. Because the combination of 6.7 billion people equipped on average with technologies millions of times more powerful than previous generations ever had at their disposal produces this collision if we remain unaware of what we are doing. And so the challenge we face is to lift the level of our consciousness and to become more aware of what we are doing, who we are, our connections to one another, and the choices that confront us in the human future. Mahatma Gandhi, India's gift to the world and to history, was quoted many times during the training session just concluded here. Of course, he felt that perhaps the most powerful force for constructive change was Satyagraha, 
Seek the truth. Truth force. The truth about the climate crisis is the key to lifting our consciousness about who we are. These challenges we face, the ones that I mentioned face India and face the world as a whole, sometimes masquerade as political problems. And we're tempted to feel frustration, confusion, uncertainty, and be daunted by the extreme difficulty of even attempting to solve them. Our real challenge is to see them in their true light, not as political problems, but as moral imperatives. There have, in times past, been generations that have accepted generational challenges, hero generations, those who defeated fascism in World War II in the victorious countries returned to form the United Nations and the Marshall Plan and to unify Europe and to create the world trading system. Because having walked through that fire, they gained, almost without realizing they were doing so, a capacity for moral authority and long-term vision that they never knew they had in the past. And so when their leaders said, it's time we steered by the stars and not by the lights of every passing ship, they said, you're right. When they said, we may have to have higher taxes in order to finance this effort to lift our adversaries from the battlefield, from their knees, and walk with them into independence and freedom, they said, yes, you're right. When their leaders said, it may take 50 years for this to work, they said, that's okay, we're in. Because we're tired of Europe exporting world wars to the rest of the planet. We see the need to take a longer term approach and try to come up with a better future. That's the challenge we face now. Guiding by the lights of every passing ship will not suffice for us any longer. We are one people. We live in separate nation states. We are proud of our differences, and we will feed, feel pride in our nations and in our different creeds and beliefs. But ultimately, we are one people on one planet. Don't let anybody tell you the solution to the climate crisis is colonizing outer space. In the United States, we couldn't even evacuate New Orleans. <laughs> this is our home. It is endangered. Now is the time. This is the place. And we are the people who must accept this challenge. This generation, those speaking liberally about the term generation, those alive today must become a hero generation. It will not be easy. It will be hard. Not rising to this challenge will be much harder still. I believe that we should see the opportunity, rise to meet it, and keep our sights on the obligation we have to those who come after, so that a thousand years from now, people will say they were the ones who did it. And my final point is this. This should not be undertaken with a sense of burden, with a feeling that woe is us. This challenge should be seen as a privilege, as an opportunity, as a thrilling challenge to undertake work that is worthy of our best efforts, of all of our energies, with joy in our hearts, so that we can feel confident that as we pass this earth on to those who come after, we have done our part and done it well. We have everything we need, save political will. But as you know, in this world's largest democracy, 
Political will is a renewable resource. Thank you very much.